Michael McCormick, you're very welcome uh, to Australia um, by the magic of Zoom. And mm. um, uh, 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 I was delighted to be able to program your film, Breaking Out, um, the story of, of Fergus O'Farrell. Tell us, um, uh, can you tell us how you got involved in, uh, in making the uh, film at the, at the beginning? Sure, yeah. Um, so I suppose, first and foremost, I was about uh, 14 or 15 and I was a music mad teenager. And it was uh, a couple of years after uh, Live Aid. And somebody thought it was a brilliant idea that there should be a, a concert to benefit the unemployed in Ireland. And they called it Self Aid. Yeah, and I remember that. Yeah. There was concerts all over the country. Um, uh, a very uh, weird pursuit it was, but uh, loads, loads of bands around at the time. And I was doing backline at one of these, the smaller gigs. Um, and every band coming on stage was that standard kind of Irish band of the time. And then Interference walked on stage and they had a bit of a swagger. And there was a guy standing at the mic and he had this kind of rock star pose. And when he opened his mouth, I was, I was pretty much floored. And I thought he was as cool, uh, cool as anything I'd ever seen. And when I saw him leave the stage and he sat into a wheelchair, the poor guy couldn't get away from me because this 15 year old music man lad went over and bent his ear. And I continued to do that for years. And like so many others, uh, didn't really understand it when they didn't achieve the fame that we thought they deserved because they were so good and so different. Um, and like so many bands, they broke up. And many years later, people started talking about them again. There was a television special on their music called Other Voices. And they started playing around again. And when I was at one of the gigs, one of the members knew I was then making uh, documentaries and he came up to me and he said, would you ever think of making a documentary? And I said, at that time, music documentaries were not getting any backing whatsoever. And I said, I don't know whether a music documentary on a niche band is going to cut the mustard here. And he said, well, is that, is that what it is or is it about him? So I went up to Fergus and I said, uh, could I come down and meet him? He he lived at the time in a place called Skull in West Cork. And I went down and I put a camera on him and we started chatting at the start of the weekend and he never stopped talking for the whole weekend. And at the end of it, I was leaving and I was buzzing and I was gone. It's an incredible story. And uh, I had a fair idea at that point that I was going to keep at it until I got it told. And that took 17 years. Well, wow, that's a, a, a long time. Um, what, what, what are the um, challenges of, of making a film over that period of time? Um, still believing in it is probably the biggest challenge because in the very early days, um, Film Ireland, as they were called at the time, would have been uh, would have seen the earliest footage and were very interested. Uh, and different production companies got involved and went to try and raise funds to tell the story. And actually, funnily enough, the treatment that I wrote back in as, as early as 2008 wasn't that far removed from the film uh, that was made because his story was was in, he lived a lot in his head because Fergus had muscular dystrophy and he spent a lot of time uh, at home and he had these flights of fancy. And so when he talked, he, it, there was a reason why he was one of the best things I ever filmed. He jumped off the screen and the stories he was he would tell, I, I would be thinking about ways of, of interpreting them. Um, and so <clears throat> despite the fact that the, that budget wasn't coming in over the years, and it's very everybody knows who makes documentaries it is very very difficult and yeah. i don't i understand why backers are so reticent you don't have a you don't have an end story for them and i particularly didn't have one i in a treatment i i kind of knew where it was going and fergus was always supposed to be there to to see it through with me but uh but it's the keeping going it's the belief in 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 what you're doing and uh and that despite how long it's taking, that when it's going to be finished, it's going to move people. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I think at some point you did mention in the film about the reality of record companies and, and you know, the kind of commercial um, appraisal that they make, which, you know, is kind of the, the clash where the art meets the business. Um, and and uh, um, so was like when you were saying that you, you talked to people, but then it didn't go any further. Was that the kind of reception that you were getting? It's pretty similar to the sort of reception that Fergus was getting for his music. I mean, the, the, the film started to almost emulate what was going on in his career. His music was loved by the people who knew it, but he couldn't get it further uh, out there, uh, partly because it was so difficult for him to travel with the muscular dystrophy, so he couldn't tour as much as, as other bands could. And it, in a similar way, I would walk into a room and I would tell people this is a story about an unknown musician who's got muscular dystrophy. Um, uh, but, you know, I was trying to get across and eventually, you know, it, it did get across to people that, you know, a good story is a good story. You don't need to be making a, a film about somebody that everybody knows. I I was always trying to get across the point, you know, people are when people discover this guy, they're going to fall in love with him. And that's what makes the film. Yeah. So you were mentioning about the Irish scene. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Irish, the, the music that was happening? I know you, you mentioned... Um, something happens and uh, a house and Fat Lady sings. Um, but just that scene in Dublin at the, at the time, do you, do you want to recreate that? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Dublin was a completely different place at the time. Like, like it, it, it was a city that um, there wasn't much money around. There was a lot of squatting. Um, Interference lived in a, an old shoe factory in the middle of Dublin. And they were a collective of musicians. As I said, when you saw them live, which was not very often, you knew something different was happening. And they gave an open invitation at the time to other bands to come and use this factory to, to rehearse. So the Hot House Flyers were kicking off at the time and were the, the, the new hope for everybody. The Black Velvet Band were another band. You know, everybody was trying to get on the coattails of U2's success at the time. So... As you said there, something happens, a house, an emotional fish. There was a wealth of really, really strong um, strong bands coming through, all trying to get to the next level and interference were one of them. But what, the wonderful thing about it was that out of that scene grew yet another scene. So when you'd be standing at an interference concert, you'd have Glenn Hansard over on one side, Mick Christopher on the other, uh, Mundy would be there, you know, so they were all buskers at the time or they just started out and you could see that, you know, if this crowd are here and they realize how good interference are, you know, it bodes well for the next generation. So it was, it was a wonderful time for music in Ireland. Yeah. You mentioned, um, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, um, then Hansard, um, so he's in the film about the, um, the, the, the um, excitement, that was there when he when he when he went to see um, interference. So that that was all a bit, um, that uh, time when when the uh, well was that before the frames or uh, I I was out yeah. of Ireland. I was I was gone from eighty five. I'm afraid. So uh, I had been quite involved with putting on gigs in in um, in Drada. So I knew a lot of a lot of those bands, but. Um, I didn't. I missed the frames. I don't, it wasn't until they came to Sydney and I went along, and, and the whole audience knew every word of every song. And I was like, I "Think right, I'm, I definitely missed this." But um, so, it, it, yeah, that that uh, era, era with Glenn Hansard uh, was that was part of that too. Yeah. So Glenn would have been busking on the streets of Dublin at the time, and would have gone up to factory where interference lived and like a lot of us was kind of in awe of what they were creating because what other musicians could see with them is that they were inside in this factory they were rehearsing constantly they didn't try to sound like anything else so that was inspirational to a lot of musicians and so yeah the frames grew out of that over the the next couple of years uh, and so did many others do you want to tell us a little bit, like you said, because you were working um, uh, with your, your own um, 
uh, evolution as as a filmmaker. So you obviously you, you've been working with with bands. You mentioned earlier. Yeah, early. yeah, yeah. I was as a as a young mad music fan. I was working with bands, and then I I started playing with bands myself. Uh, there was so many bands in Dublin time. Everyone was trying to do something, uh, and then. I obviously copped on at one stage that the music um, probably wasn't the path. So I started to look at ways in which I could be still involved in music. So I got into uh, into into making um, uh, programs for television and finally found that my niche was, well, when you're telling stories, whether it be in current affairs or whether it be in entertainment, our documentary it's all about the telling of the story and how you tell it so i spent years telling stories for the national broadcaster in ireland rte both freelance and uh, internally with them and you know found a way uh, a love for for telling those stories so uh, so i've made i'd say over 40 documentaries for rte and uh, in that time obviously as i said i was making breaking out uh, in my spare time and took two years out to concentrate on finishing it. Right. Um, could, could, can you think of any special moments during the making of the, the film that you, that stand out for you? Yeah, I survived. I, know, I, <laughs> I, I basically, I suppose, um, I mean, I, I went over to film with him in Radio City Music Hall um, the thing about Fergus O'Farrell and interference is it, it, the, people would think that they wouldn't know them, but if anyone had come across the film once, um, many people thought that Glenn and Marquetta uh, and the Swell Season, the, all the songs in the film were theirs, but there was this, Glenn wanted to almost showcase uh, what Fergus uh, and interference did. So Gold, one of Fergus's songs, features in Once, and when it um, actually, this was before it went on to become a musical. But Glenn invited Interference over to uh, support him in Radio City Music Hall after winning the Oscar uh, for the swell season in once. And um, even though it still didn't have a budget, I did what all filmmakers do, and I blagged me way in to Radio City Music Hall. Radiohead had been in there a month previous. And I won't tell you what they were charged for filming there, but I managed to get in with three cameras and uh, record what, what is a really special moment for for somebody who craved, you know, recognition like all artists do. But this was somebody who didn't have the opportunity to get out there and uh, and play to people around the world. So. Um, so it was a really special thing to be in Radio City, City Music Hall and see him take the moment. Uh, and it's one of the standout parts of the film when you see that he's basically taking this audience who wouldn't have known who he was or, or his music and taking them along and uh, winning them over. What, what would you hope for um, audiences to take away from watching the film? Um, I think I think one of the things I've realized is that you know, particularly what we've, got, we've all gone through over the last couple of years, um, it's been difficult for people, uh, for, the, for the entertainment industry, obviously, to get people to go out there and go to shows, whether that be live gigs or cinema. And people, it took a while before people started going back. And now that they're going back, I would, I would really impress upon them, you know, don't go back to the cinema just to see a blockbuster go out there and see the stories that maybe you don't know that much about. I think the great thing about documentary, and it's the reason I love documentary, is I love going to a, a documentary and not really knowing anything about it and being surprised by how, how stories can be told and how you can be moved. I think when people see Breaking Out and they hear the story of, of Fergus O'Farrell, uh, you can't help but you know, there's a lot of, of joy and sadness in it. But by the end, uh, anybody that was leaving the cinema uh, would come up to me uh, when I was at a screening and they would say that they felt, you know, 
invigorated and even though you know by the end of it he's gone through a hell of a lot there's a joy in the way that he approached life so i hope it's inspiring for people yeah yeah i uh was talking last night with uh hazel duke um our sack actress and 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 you know one of the things that she said about um um irish films that she thought people like to be challenged um and and a lot of people while while a lot of people will obviously watch film to escape she thought that this was a a um a, a good thing um and I, I suppose that's what drew me to the uh story um was the 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 um uh, the the light and the dark and just the you know the the, the um uh, the stories that are out there um and th they can be challenging but um i think it is um very special and, and it, it's it's a it's a fantastic film um what what um what what did you, what do you do at the moment um in terms of finding the balance between the creative and the um putting the bread on the table are you still working uh sorry uh, with um documentary yes yeah at the moment uh i'm making a documentary on um on a famous musical landmark in dublin that is under threat uh from developers um so i'm yeah constantly uh making documentaries and working on on some long-term projects so uh yeah, still being inspired to find stories and, and tell them. Great. Michael, thanks a million for taking the time to join us um, this evening. And um, uh, good luck with the, with, with the next projects. And I'm, I'm sure that we're going to get some great feedback from around Australia on, 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 um, on breaking out. Brilliant. Thanks very much.